All righty. Folks, welcome. Welcome to our second installment in the series, March on Milwaukee, a digital history series. Today's conversation, race migration and the roots of resistance in the cream city helps to further contextualize the open housing marches by taking a chance, uh, or taking a second for us to go back and think about how we as a city got to the 1960s. I'm Robert Smith, Associate Professor over in the History Department at Marquette University. I direct our uh, Center for Urban Research, Teaching and Outreach and the gentleman who works with me on this kind of stuff, Adam Carr. Adam, can you introduce yourself really quickly? Yeah, um, I, I do a bunch of different things around Milwaukee and uh, one of the honors of my life was to be involved in the 50th anniversary of the open housing marches and as many questions as we were to able to answer through that, I, I found myself with far more questions in the end. And that's why I'm glad we have this esteemed panel today to ask, I think, one of the core questions that um, I think the open housing marches poses to our city. Sure. Man, welcome. You know, we, we've got three historians of Milwaukee, Wisconsin with us. And as Adam and I often say, history is fun. History is a good time. And we've got three folks who are going to uh, give us quite a bit of their own knowledge and expertise. And then we're going to have a good time as well. Let me start by introducing Joe Walzer. Joe Walzer recently completed a dissertation uh, making an old world Milwaukee that looks at the history and heritage of uh, German communities here in the city. Joe, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Glad you're with us today. And then, of course, we've got Reggie Jackson. Reggie Jackson is a busy f man these days. He's uh, writing a lot. He's researching a lot. He's worked over at America's Black Holocaust Museum. He's now uh, doing some journalism, and he also has a business, Nurturing Diversity. Reggie, we call on you a lot. Thank you for your time. How are you doing today? I'm great, great, great. Uh, good to be part of this, uh, this esteemed group. Uh, looking forward to the conversation today. Absolutely, welcome. And there's one gentleman when we talk about Milwaukee history, his name is synonymous with that. Uh, we could go on and on about the various work and writings and historical uh, research and commentary that John Goethe has provided us, uh, none more important than the making of Milwaukee, the seminal work. John Gerda, thank you for joining us today. And can you tell us really quickly, where are you again? Uh, I'm in Upper Michigan, not too far from Montanagan, sheltering in place and uh, we're far enough away from people we don't, don't wash our hands. Well, we thank you for joining us today and uh, let us know if there's any technology issues on your end. Uh, folks, we are, are going to do three things today. And the, the first of which is very much related to what we have been doing around some, some pedagogy and curricular stuff. Uh, we're going to chunk our conversation in three distinct sections. Uh, first of which we're gonna do a bit of a historical photograph exercise for about 15 minutes in which we'll show some images from the open housing marches and some images that our panelists have shared with us. And we're gonna use these images as a way to talk about some of the key historical developments that got us to the 1950s and 60s. We'll talk about uh, some of the key immigrant and migrant groups and how they got here, how the city gets sorted along racial lines, and then also just making sure to take a moment to talk about how photos and photographs more broadly help us teach Milwaukee history and our, our uh, city's cultural histories. The second thing we're going to do is give these uh, researchers a chance to talk about their craft. So the next 15 minutes or so, we'll ask them to talk a little bit about how they go about the, the task and the art of uh, researching and writing about Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, we'll get a bit into their creative process and then also wrap up with some conversations about teaching Milwaukee history. And then the last 15 minutes, we'll give folks plenty of time to ask some questions of our panelists and get us thinking about some of the key takeaways around Milwaukee history that we ought to be mindful of, and then also uh, tips and ideas about delivering this history in the various media that are available, particularly in this moment, it's important for us to think about all the avenues and opportunities that learning can continue to occur. Alrighty, folks, we're getting started with the first section, um, which will be this process by which we use photographs to explore and uncover history. Adam, why don't you take us uh, into this process? This is your world. 
You're muted, big guy. There we go. Um, give me one second here. So Rob and I, in presenting this, which we've done numerous times, we actually, we mentioned this last week, but it bears repeating. We learned how important it is to, um, to get this into a dynamic conversation that invites people into the space with us. Um, uh, how important media is. We actually found out in the Vell Phillips Juvenile Detention Center, um, we put some of these images in front of the young men and they started seeing things in these images that we hadn't seen yet and introducing new parts of the story to us. So I just wanted to share this kind of opening salvo of photos of the open housing marches um, for our panelists to take a look at and respond to a little bit. We're talking about kind of the, the, the period of time in Milwaukee that led up to the open housing marches. You can see here just that, that sign open housing in the big ground, uh, crowd that's congregated around that topic. It was, it was this incredible flashpoint, open housing in the city of Milwaukee. Um, these are some of the images that we've shown and that, that demonstrate just how dramatic, how full of conflict, how full of um, how full of just sort of emotion that entire t period of time was in Milwaukee. Um, here we see a confrontation between the youth council and police. Um, here are counter protesters here for a moment commingling, but then also standing here um, and sending a very loud and clear message to the the youth council, to the commandos, to Bell Phillips and Father Grappi. Um, what they what what people thought of them on the south side. These are I actually think in some ways um, it's important to, to look at this image without flinching because it's it can be difficult to look at, knowing that in the same way that the marchers are still alive, so are the counter protesters. Um, some more dramatic images of just what it looked like and what it felt like. And I want to close with um, actually this image here, which is a little bit smaller, but. Just, just the general idea, and this is sort of the, the last piece I want to share before turning it to the panelists. Um, the Youth Council in the years uh, prior to, and actually in the year subsequent to the open housing marches, took on a number of different campaigns. So they worked on school desegregation, they would protested the Eagles Club and employment discrimination, other, other campaigns, but it wasn't until they found open housing that they ignited the counter protests of the magnitude that they saw on the near south side of Milwaukee. Um, you know, as many as 13,000 angry white counter protesters came out to meet them. And I think in a lot of ways, it, 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 cause in the mind of those counter protesters, it must've been because there was some transgression there or it was literally a sense of trespassing on the part of these young black marchers. So, these images, I, I, you know, I can scroll back through them, but I just wanted to share them for our panelists and for our audience just to see. Um, I actually think the color pictures always make them look, feel a little bit less in the past than the black and white ones, but just to see a little bit of, you know, just how, how, how much was swirling around Milwaukee at this point in time and talk a little bit about what was happening on the near south side of Milwaukee and on, uh, and on the north side of Milwaukee. That, that sort of set the stage for this clash. And that is kind of my open prompt to you all. And now we can just talk. Uh, for me, some of those images are nostalgic. Uh, I was, wasn't part of the open housing marches the way at school for most of those, but uh, uh, was part of the, the marches uh, with Father Grappi on Judge Cannon's home out in Wauwatosa. You know, we're trying, we're trying to lift the, the Eagles, whites only uh, membership policy. Uh, but after I graduated from college, I came down to the, the South Side and worked for three years at a place called Journey House in 16th and Washington, now Cesar Chavez in Washington. And a lot of those kids were the ones who'd been on the, on the streets throwing bricks at the, the marchers as they came down. Uh, so it was, it was really, uh, no, there was a lot, a lot of uh, sort of dissonance in the kind of what was going on because we, 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 we loved those kids, got along with those kids, but they were, they were doing some things that were pretty hateful, uh, you know, just two, two years earlier. And unapologetically, uh, you know, as time went on, the neighborhood became more and more Latino and African American as well. Uh, so that became kind of a moot point, but it was uh obviously it was it was a, a really volatile and in some ways anarchic time in milwaukee's history 
I think it's uh, thinking back to the image of the uh, folks walking around with swastikas. I mean, that's really remarkable uh, imagery to think about, particularly on the near south side where there were so many poles, that that was happening, you know, only 20, 25 years after uh, the Second World War, right? And, and it was so clearly still fresh in the minds of folks in that neighborhood that they, that folks with, presumably with Polish heritage to have adopted the, the swastika as a sign of, um, of, of racial belonging in the city is a truly remarkable uh, thing to behold. We'll, we'll never know, but my guess is that most of those people were not of Polish heritage. You know, okay. the, the people who were there on 16th Street when I was there uh, were largely people from rural Wisconsin. You know, they were people okay. who kind of come in for factory jobs. Uh, so they were, they could have been anything, you know, Germans, Polish, uh, Scandinavian, Irish, uh, Yankee. Uh, but it was, it was very much, it wasn't Appalachian, but it was sort of Milwaukee's version of Appalachian. You know, it was people coming from the countryside to, to work in urban factories, mm -hmm. you know, and that was the real flashpoint there was Crazy Jim's Auto Lot. <laughs> Adam talks was, a lot about Crazy Jim's. <laughs> oh, it, it, it was, um, and that, that was a block north of Journey House. Uh, Jim, Jim Grove, <laughs> he, he was, he was, a, he was a case, uh, but, but he was, he was kind of a, a magnet, you know, for a lot of the, a lot of the racist opposition to those those marches, uh, and that was so. Th there was it. I don't think it had any identifiable ethnic component. You know, it was it was, it was largely you know, working class white, uh, more generically, and, and and rural especially. Is it somewhat surprising then that by the 1960s that this broader category of white had um, begun to play a role in the city so remarkably um, connected to distinct European cultural threads? Actually, I, I, that's something too, Rob. I, that's a point that I is on my mind a lot, which is Milwaukee is a city that was proud of its differentiated European identity of whiteness not being a monolith. And in some ways, like, yeah, I agree with you, Rob, that it, it's almost surprising to see kind of a whiteness become this rallying. I mean, not surprising, but like Milwaukee might be the last place you'd expect that to happen because there were such distinct cultural groups within a, a pan-European identity. No, one thing I've said over the years was that uh, if you have a strong sense of us, you're going to have a strong sense of them. Mm -hmm. And in Milwaukee, there was a, there really were some very strong ethnic cultures. And I think Joe can has, has studied this. The fact that we had a non-English speaking language group uh, that was, that was dominant here, the Germans. You know, they were majority of the population. Uh, in some ways that made Milwaukee safe for ethnicity, of the European kind. You know, the fact that you had, uh, in Boston, for instance, so the, the Yankee overlay is, is what drives things there. Uh, in Milwaukee, it was the Germans. So it was okay to speak Polish or Italian or Slovenian or whatever. But the thing that they could all agree on was that they were white. Mm -hmm. And when that became after World War II, especially between 50 and 70, you know, when you have the, uh, the Great Migration really you know, kind of growing into high gear in those post-war years, you know, that's when it became you know, something of a, a more a linchpin of a, a cross-cultural identity. But the, in terms of some of the neighborhood dynamics, the North Side, you know, one reason there was such entrenched resistance there was that you had these pretty intact German communities that lasted until well after World War II. So when you had African-Americans moving just as the Germans had in that same northwesterly direction. You know, you had oil and water. You, know, you had a real, real explosive you know, kind of a encounter there. Yeah, and I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joe. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to add to that. And, and um, you know, I think that, that to your point that, that I think one of the most remarkable things about ethnicity in the city is its its continued prevalence, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't changed, sure. right? And so um, whiteness, you know, in Milwaukee as in elsewhere, um, to ascribe to the to whiteness and the visions and ideals of, of whiteness uh, meant access to things like jobs mm -hmm. and access to services. And, and it wasn't just, um, you know, agreeing on that. It, it, they're like, there were 
things that came along sure. with shedding, maybe not shedding, but um, uh, taking on this this racial identity. Um, and so I think that that what we're seeing in a lot of, of those images, particularly how violently uh, folks on the South Side were so willing to, to resist open housing um, is kind of a, a protection of, of that quote unquote right that, that they felt like they had, that they had earned. Um, and if we could maybe uh, pull up a couple of those images, Adam, that I had uh, 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 added. Okay. Uh, we can see, you know, 20 years, I mean, yes, all right, 20 years ago, um, we had uh, the Second World War, but also really violent strikes at Alice Chalmers um, that had, um, you know, that had pitted, you know, what we would think of, of white folks against white folks, mm. right? Uh, trying to gain access, trying to, to gain the rights and privileges and a better life in um, in this community. Um, and, and I think that, that the violent resistance to, uh, uh, to the open housing, um, the marches were, you know, kind of in, in some way, the logic, you know, as, as flawed as it absolutely was, was kind of this vision of protection. Mm -hmm. 